So we're now live. Hello there and welcome to this plenary session at the Harassus Global Meeting. Uh, my name is Rosalind Matheson from Bloomberg in London and I'm delighted to be with you all today and with this esteemed panel uh, for this interesting topic. Uh, I was actually reflecting on the topic for the plenary today and I was struck by how it feels every day that we're glued to statistics in some fashion. More than 173 million virus cases, more than 3.7 million official deaths, with the unofficial number no doubt much higher, uh, lost economic output in the trillions. At the same time, more than 2 billion COVID inoculation doses given and worldwide weekly infections, the least in almost three months. Uh, economic output lost in the trillions. There's a lot to measure. And one of the things that we somehow also need to map in all of this is trust or potentially distrust. Has faith in global institutions gone up or down in the past year? In governments, in the health industry, in bureaucracy. And that's something that does bear examination uh, because trust between governments and those who are governed leads to, well, it leads to good governance. Trusting governments means people are more willing to adhere to rules and regulation, for example. It allows governments to act quickly and decisively. It allows implementation. It helps things like vaccination rates and it limits risky behaviour. And so to facilitate that trust, governments need to be clear. They need to explain. And as much as possible, they need to avoid sudden, frequent changes of course. There is a fair body of work out there that shows that in the early part of the pandemic, at least, there was a, a rally around the flag mood in many countries that will get through this together. But equally, the evidence shows that as time has gone on, that trust has faded and scepticism has crept in. Adherence has fallen. People, my own anecdotal evidence in London, have stopped wearing masks. They don't rush to get vaccinated. They stop social distancing. They question the data and they may even question government policy. And alongside that public trust in governments, there's the question of trust and sharing between governments, between regions, between governments and key institutions like the WHO, the UN more broadly. On the one hand, it's amazing how quickly the world has developed vaccines and those vaccines are being distributed. Equally, vaccine sharing in many places has been slow and data sharing has been patchy. And how much is that potentially creating lost opportunity? As we hopefully come out the tunnel of the, of the pandemic and we start to restore our lives and our economies, what sort of world are we going to be creating? What lessons are we taking for other common issues where sharing and trust is required? Like climate change, poverty alleviation, the fight against other terrible diseases like malaria, like dengue fever and so on. The pandemic has brought us enormous challenges and fighting it in the aftermath could equally provide us with opportunities when it comes to governance. The risk is that we fall back in old ways and old habits and we miss the opportunity for structural change. I am delighted to welcome our panellists here today to discuss this in more detail. I'm going to invite each of them to speak for several minutes after which we can open up to questions. There's a comment bar on the platform. I'd encourage you to put your comments and questions there where I can see them and ask our panelists the questions on your behalf. I would like to start by inviting Minister Rania al mashat who's the Minister of International Cooperation in Egypt, to begin uh, with her opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and uh, for um, uh, pinpointing a very uh, important uh, topic in general. Uh, credibility uh, of governments uh, is a function of transparency, uh, and it's through transparency that we increase trust. Uh, maybe one of the uh, very distinguishing uh, factors in the pandemic is that nothing could be hidden. If, uh, if there is uh, uh, you know, a pressure on hospitals, it is evident. If uh, people are, more people are getting sick, it is evident. So uh, there was, uh, uh, you know, I don't, want to, I don't want to say pressure, but there was, uh, 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 it was a catalyst for governments to actually uh, communicate uh, more frequently uh, with the public. And this was uh, extremely evident across uh, different countries. Um, and it is, it is through that uh, a dialogue uh, that uh, different uh, citizens in different countries uh, became more careful with masks and so forth. 
So what I'm trying to say is that um, uh, one of the lessons uh, of the pandemic is uh, the power of communication. Uh, how, uh, uh, you know, in the age uh, that we live in today, something happening in one country goes all over the world. Uh, and this has put, uh, I would say, more checks and balances uh, in on the work of the different institutions and the different organizations. It has pushed uh, for uh, a higher level of collaboration. Uh, something else which is extremely important as Ministry of International Cooperation, uh, we work with all our bilateral and multilateral development partners. And early on in the pandemic, uh, through, again, the importance of communication, uh, we were able to um, uh, reach out to our partners to show uh, the needs uh, of uh, the government early on, whether they were related to health, whether they were related to uh, equipment. Uh, and it was through collaboration that many of these, um, uh, uh, you know, the, we had seen uh, fruits out of this collaboration through multi-stakeholder platforms, country dialogues, uh, so this was, uh, again, a, a tool for us uh, to uh, create a platform uh, of communication pushing uh, for transparency and trust between uh, us and our different development partners. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'd now like to turn to Taro Kono, who's the Minister for Administrative Reform and Regulatory Reform in Japan and of course has had many other key roles in Japan previously, including foreign minister. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much for this opportunity today. Well, as you know, Japan is an island country. And uh, as COVID-19 spread throughout the world, we had to close down the country. And uh, we were worried about uh, disruption in uh, energy and food supply. But surprisingly, the energy supply, food supply, there was no disruption uh, throughout all this uh, pandemic. And uh, I guess our global system is very strong and uh, resilient. I think we can have faith in a global system now. The other thing we learned is uh, we can share data. I mean, uh, some consumer product or gold or oil. We cannot share gold or oil. If I own oil, you don't. But data, we can share. Actually, if we share more data, uh, more value those data have. Um, we share a lot of data to speed up the vaccine development. And, uh, I mean, it was amazing. We now have vaccine and uh, we have been inoculating uh, for COVID-19. So uh, we can do this better. Uh, the bad thing is, you know, uh, up to up to the developing the vaccine, we are very successful, the sharing. But uh, once the data turn into product, we were not, we stopped sharing. Some people keep buying more than their population, and uh, we are not uh, sharing the vaccine equally among the people. So we need to learn, uh, we need to learn to share data to increase its values. And uh, for a lot of international systems, uh, some we succeed and some we fail. Uh, WHO did uh, a good job but we still exclude Taiwan. Uh, when we try to fight against the pandemic, we need to put everyone on board. If there's uh, anyone who is not present, and then there could be a black hole. So we need to build a trust uh, among the global institution as well. Um, some people are trying to use vaccine as a diplomatic tool. Um, I don't think that was right. And some country trying to sell or donate uh, monitoring technologies saying this technology is to monitor uh, the COVID-19 patient to stop the spreading it. But actually those technology uh, have been used to monitor the opposition to the government. So we, we have, we have seen some ugly side of diplomacy, 
But uh, once this is over, I think we need to rebuild the international order. So there's a lot of things we need to work on after COVID-19. But for now, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Kono. We do have some um, pre-recorded remarks from the Minister who wasn't able to join us, but we're not able to play those just yet. So at some point uh, during the panel, we will get those comments from uh, our esteemed colleague from India. Um, so I would like to just begin then by asking some questions of our panellists. And Mr Kono, I wanted to follow up something that you, that you talked about um, and you mentioned uh, some of the the ways that governments have used the pandemic for geopolitical means. And I wondered how much did the pre-existing global structure where we had some countries already distrusting each other or institutions distrusting each other and not in that habit of sharing openly, how much did the existing environment going into the pandemic play into some of the ways that we've seen that come during the pandemic itself? Um, well, some government uh, definitely tried to use this pandemic to sell their political system or ideology. Uh, in order to fight against COVID-19, uh, it is sometimes uh, important to give uh, government some authority uh, authority to lock down the cities or authority to stop the movement of the people and those things. So some country trying to sell the uh, dictatorship would be more uh, powerful to fight against uh, COVID-19. And uh, I don't I don't think it is right. I mean, the in Japan, the central government of Japan has no authority to lock down the cities. We don't have authority to uh, command doctors to come forward for inoculation. We had to ask people to stay home. The central government is still asking doctor to help us vaccinate the people. And we have been still able to contain COVID-19. So actually, uh, democracy and uh, freedom are uh, still very important in our society. But in some society that uh, democracy is used uh, against it, uh, some people saying that democracy will slow down the process in fight against the COVID-19. I don't think that is right. So we need to promote the value of democracy, rule of law, freedom, even after the COVID-19. And I think it is very important uh, for us, the like-minded country, to sit down and trying to rebuild the value, uh, the common value we shared uh, after the World War II. And would you, would you include inclusion in that? You did mention Taiwan in your opening remarks. And of course, Taiwan is, a, is excluded from certain institutions, including uh, active involvement in the WHO. Do you think that that's been to the detriment of the fight against the pandemic and particularly, again, the sharing of data? And well, uh, WHO is a uh, very unique uh, international organization. Uh, it takes leadership to fight against COVID-19. And in terms of uh, science or uh, universal health coverage, we cannot exclude anybody from that forum. So there's a political argument concerning Taiwan. I understand that. But uh, when we try to fight against the pandemic, we need to put everyone on board. Thank you. I'd like to turn to Minister al with a question, which is um, sort of just following up on some of the opening remarks that you made, um, and particularly your role in international cooperation. I mean, what have you seen uh, through the past year from your perspective as examples of good practice? Like what has been 
successful in all of this because there have been some moments of great global cooperation. And equally, what, what, where have you seen uh, the, the parts of this, I want a bit of a phrase, where it could have been? Um, I believe that uh, very early on when the pandemic uh, broke, there was a, a feeling that multilateralism has come to an end and that uh, every country should be on its own. There was just this 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 uh, feeling of mistrust, if you will. But I think, uh, uh, you know, two months into it, uh, it was very clear that we are all in this together. And uh, if we used to talk about financial contagion, today we're talking about this pandemic contagion. So what happens in one country definitely affects uh, the other countries. And when the economic slowdown uh, happened, it, it affected everybody. Look at aviation, look at tourism, look at... Uh, um, the ability to move, mobility itself. So this required uh, a, a rethinking or a rhetoric, um, a stronger rhetoric around multilateralism. We saw uh, countries uh, uh, having uh, more dialogue. Uh, we saw very quickly uh, uh, G20 taking uh, different initiatives to alleviate uh, uh, debt on the very poor countries in Africa. So there was, I would, I would think, a renewed uh, uh, discovery uh, of the importance of working together. And this is going to push other agendas as we see on the climate change. It used to be uh, uh, only a group of countries talking about it. Today, green recovery is something which is, uh, is very uh, much discussed. Uh, there are financing tools for the green recovery. Uh, there's a, a, a renewed, um, I would say, uh, push uh, towards uh, common denominators between countries. That said, however, uh, we find a discrepancy in how different financial institutions uh, are, are moving forward. Some are more flexible and have been able to uh, uh, provide uh, assistance uh, uh, financing uh, quicker than others. Uh, others have been uh, constrained, if you will, by uh, some of their either internal uh, uh, bureaucracies or maybe their capital. So I believe that going forward, uh, uh, given uh, the need uh, or given the understanding that what happens uh, in one country you know, affects everybody, uh, there is definitely a, a need for, uh, if we borrow what the IMF said, uh, all hands on the deck. We need all institutions on the deck to be able to push, uh, uh, you know, the, or mitigate the, you know, further downfalls on, on, different, on different countries. So I would, I would, I would just say that uh, we need to see, um, uh, a, 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 you know, a stronger uh, commitment, if you will, from different institutions to, uh, to push uh, for the reforms that certain uh, emerging countries are, are doing to pull themselves out of the pandemic. Because it does feel, as you were saying, that there are a lot of things that could be taken from this experience and applied to many other, what you would think of as global common issues, uh, be it climate change, as you mentioned, fighting poverty, inequality, uh, innovation, education, uh, and, and so on. Uh, and these are things that affect every country, um, as, as you pointed out. But how confident are you that we will take what we've learned here and apply it elsewhere? As you said, there is that challenge, particularly around financial institutions and reform in terms of being more flexible, perhaps in terms of things like financing and so on. Uh, do you see momentum pushing on from this into those other important areas? So all the uh, all the objectives that you mentioned, uh, uh, poverty, no hunger, uh, clean water, all of these come under the 17 UN Sustainable Development Goals. So uh, countries came together in 2015, agreed that there are 17 global goals. Uh, every country uh, put its 2030 development agenda so that uh, when 2030 comes, we try and see how these common goals across humanity can be fulfilled. Of course, the pandemic came. There's a derail there was a fear that it would derail the fulfillment of the SDGs and also the financing uh, of the SDGs, we around uh, more than uh, three trillion dollars, if you will, to 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 be able to close these uh, these gaps. So, what's going to happen now is that capital is going to become very select, and it's very important that every country tries to distinguish itself by the strength of the reforms and its commitment uh, to uh, pushing forward. As capital from financial institutions or financing from finance for multilateral institutions is is less than before. Uh, the private sector, sovereign wealth funds can come in. And you need to give a compelling case. 
Uh, and that's why, uh, you know, these concepts of ESG have come out so that every country as they're designing their projects, uh, whether they're sovereign projects or even with private sector, that these, these common uh, uh, goals are there because capital today wants to be impactful. Capital today wants to be purposeful. Uh, and it, it all revolves around uh, uh, trying to fulfill these, uh, uh, these sustainable development goals. In our case, as, as a country, uh, uh, the ministry has come out with principles of economic diplomacy. We have three principles. The first one, multi-stakeholder platforms. That's what, where we engage uh, uh, all development partners uh, on what our prospects are, what the projects we need are. The second thing we did, the second principle is that we mapped uh, all our uh, development finance, the ODA finance, to SDGs so that everyone can see uh, where the dollars went to serve uh, these global goals. And number three, we create a common narrative with our developed partners, people at the core uh, uh, projects in action and purpose as the driver. So there's there's this uh, 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 you know keen effort in trying to make sure that uh, the reform agenda is well known and that every uh, uh, everyone who wants to come and create impact finds finds a venue. Uh, this is, I guess, a question for both of you. Um, so whoever would like to go first. Uh, but it, it, in terms of kind of maintaining a sense of trust in government uh, and sharing a momentum, there is the reality that many people are saying, well, it's been very difficult. I've been out of work for a year or, or I've had other challenges, um, but somehow it's going to be OK and the economy is going to pick up and my job will come back. Uh, but for, for governments everywhere, there is the challenge that at some point hard decisions have to be made around spending. Some governments are going to have to confront the reality of potentially raising taxes because of the amount of money that's had to be understandably spent through this process. It's, so then people will say, well, now the taps are being turned off, taxes are being raised, we're in a difficult fiscal environment. Um, all the money that you said was going to come for projects and reform can't come because there is no money. So what is the challenge there, the future challenge, I guess, for governments in terms of maintaining that trust contract with their people that the governments will continue to ensure that they're taken care of? Um, I'll open that to... Um, well, the Japanese people have been through... Uh, similar things before. We had a uh, huge earthquakes in Kobe back in 1995 and uh, Great East Japan earthquake uh, recently. And uh, each time the government had to come rescue people, spend a lot of money to reconstruct, and uh, we would uh, share through the taxation uh, for some time. We still uh, paying some additional tax for recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake. So this pandemic, the government need to do whatever it takes to sustain the economy. And once it's come back, I think, well, uh, people need to uh, pay back through the tax. But it is not the time yet. Uh, it is still the economy is trying to recover and the uh, government trying to sustain the people. So it is not a time to uh, discuss how we're going to finance this this time. But uh, government need to do uh, whatever it takes to uh, keep the people going. Um, what I can what I can say is that, uh, you know, um, Governments have to be time consistent and time consistent means that uh, uh, you take policy actions given the information set that exists. And today we are in an information set, set that, that changes uh, uh, every moment. So I think uh, what has happened over the past uh, year and few months uh, is people being more susceptible to the idea that shocks can happen. And they come in different uh, in different uh, forms. Uh, uh, once it's a partial lockdown, uh, uh, once it's no uh, aviation for some time, etc. Uh, everybody has to go and take their vaccine. So the the important uh, uh, element for governments, especially emerging markets, uh, is that your commitment to reforming your economy, your commitment to trying to push the potential of the economy to allow 
uh, for uh, additional capital to come in to allow for private sector engagement because our reform agenda is not finished yet. So, so, so trying to uh, be more proactive, less complacent, and just all the time, uh, uh, you know, not, not, not hold. I mean, not being held back by this crisis. On the contrary, trying to take it as an opportunity to showcase. Uh, that you are still committed to these uh, reforms that are going to create more employment, that are going to create more diversification. And this is what we have been trying to do on our different sectors in the country. Uh, it, is, it, is, um, uh, it is not uh, always uh, easy, but Egypt has not been uh, new to different uh, uh, challenges uh, recently. Uh, but we were the only country in the region that is growing positively in 2020, despite the pandemic. And this comes on the back of reforms that happened before 2020, and we are continuing, uh, whether they are structural reforms, whether they are uh, sectoral reforms related to renewable energy, to uh, transportation, establishing new cities. So all of this provides uh, 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 opportunities for, for the future, and that's what we're betting on. Thank you. Uh, so speaking of energy, we do actually have some, um, some remarks that were delivered to us uh, recorded by the Indian Minister for Petroleum and Natural Gas, Demendra Pradhan, who unfortunately couldn't be with us in person today. So I just would ask if we could maybe play those comments. I'm happy to be addressing this gathering virtually today. In the past two decades of this millennium were warning shots against the perils of unfettered capitalism, then 2020 should probably be marked as year when an all-out war was launched by the global community to counter such a scenario from coming pressure. The collapse of global supply chain triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic set up a very loss domino effect across the economic centers of the world. Debate between lives and livelihoods were engaging concern for many nations. Even before the pandemic hit with vengeance, the interest for investing in environmental, social and governance, ESG, had already been growing globally. The biggest issue for many was the impact of climate change and the ways to address it both as individual nation states and in making concrete efforts. However, the pandemic has brought ESG issues to the fore with the forceful urgency drawing an imperative for societal responsibility and collective action. The Indian economy has rebounded strongly from the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic flowing of the resumption of the economic activities aided by strong fiscal and policy reforms undertaken by the government of India under the dynamic leadership of Honorable Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi ji. IMF recently revised India's GDP growth forecast and has projected a growth of 11.5% in 2021, making the country the only major economy of the world to register a double-digit growth this year amidst of the coronavirus pandemic. Needless to say, energy is integral to support our fast-growing Indian economy and its ambitions. Our energy sector will be growth-centric, industry-friendly and environment-conscious. We have the onerous task of ensuring ample access to the energy to improve the lives of Indians coupled with the need to have a smaller carbon footprint and to address the needs of the all stakeholders. The oil and gas industry must define a new social contract aligned sustainability to overall cope corporate strategies and embarrassing responsible leadership. By doing so, this sector has the opportunity to contribute towards energy transition. As we approach COP26 in Glasgow later this year, it is the responsibility of the governments, civil societies, individuals and corporates to contribute. We can and we should work together. I wish this forum all success. Thank you, friends. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, I would like to uh, just follow up with a, a comment, a question again for both of you. And we sort of talked um, about the process of managing trust and sharing through the pandemic. And you've talked um, in really interesting fashion about the experiences of each of your countries 
as well in that, um, which has been sort of different and similar <laughs> in, in equal measure. I'm curious when you look back over the past year, and of course, it's one of those things where you sort of have to learn as you go in a way, you take prior experience of, of crises, but this has been a different crisis, I think, than any of us would remember. Uh, do you have, when you look back, are there any things about the way that uh, your country or government has managed this crisis that you regret or you feel you could have done differently? Um, I would uh, I would say that uh, uh, the lesson learned is that uh, you know this concept of stakeholder capitalism is really true that uh, governments, uh, businesses, uh, civil society, international community all work together in a country uh, to get out of a crisis of this magnitude. Government can do it alone. Private sector can. Uh, private sector needed help from the government initially. Civil society was very much needed in the different, uh, uh, you know, governorates to help uh, with masks and 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 health and so forth. And the international community and our development partners were fundamental as well. So I think that uh, uh, the 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 silver lining in this was that uh, uh, the cooperation, collaboration are real, are possible. And if they do happen, then we are able to get out uh, of a crisis faster or with less uh, cost uh, or loss uh, than we have we would have been if we were alone. So I think this is uh, this is the key uh, taking, and I, I I hope that we continue taking this forward in good times because uh, collaboration uh, honestly uh, does fulfill uh, bigger uh, prospects, bigger objectives, and as we are all trying. Uh, to push for our uh, the SDG agenda across, uh, whether it's uh, climate change, renewable, clean water, no poverty, gender uh, parity, uh, all of these are going to require uh, public-private partnerships. They are going to require uh, that all stakeholders are working together uh, under very clear uh, objectives. That's that's what I uh, have taken out of this and uh, will push forward. And finally, in crises, there's no time to be optimistic or pessimistic. You just have to act. And that is what I think all governments around the world tried their best to do. Well, two, two things we could have done better. The first thing is uh, Japan, or well, the Japanese government is lacking uh, emergency measures. We started the vaccination uh, for regular people. Uh, we started from the senior citizens in April. Uh, we started the vaccination for doctors and nurses in February. Uh, we were lagging behind United States or other European countries because uh, we had to do the clinical uh, trial on 160 Japanese people to make sure it's okay to try this vaccine on the Japanese. In United States, they had uh, about 3,000 people going through the clinical trial, and there must have been some Japanese Americans or Asian Americans. And if we see the records, uh, we could probably confirm the safety of the vaccine on the Japanese people. But, uh, I mean, the... Uh, Japanese has a very unique tendency towards the vaccine, and uh, we had to have safety test on the Japanese, and that delayed a couple of months. And uh, we should have uh, started the vaccination much earlier, and we couldn't do that. Uh, in, even through this pandemic, we had to go through the regular uh, trials. And so in case of emergency, we should have, the government should have some different measures to counter uh, the emergency, and we are lacking it. And uh, related to that, the division of the uh, responsibility between the central government and the local government uh, stayed the same through this pandemic. Uh, vaccination is a job for uh, 1,741 cities and towns in Japan in regular times, like when we are doing uh, regular uh, seasonal flu vaccination, it is a job for cities and towns. And uh, we are still 
asking cities and towns to do this COVID-19 vaccination. So 1,700 cities and towns are doing this every day now. Um, maybe the central government uh, should have stepped in and uh, used different measures to counter this emergency, but uh, we didn't do it. So we are simply asking uh, private doctors to come forward and do the vaccination for the people. So there are, there are some things we need to prepare for the next pandemic. I mean, we had our uh, SARS, MARS, and uh, Novus uh, flu in 2009, and this COVID-19. And there are going to be another one coming pretty soon. And are we ready? We we'll probably not. We we'll probably need to uh, change roles of the government, what we can do in terms of emergency and those things. So something we need to discuss uh, once we contain the COVID-19, uh, we need to have a big political discussion on these issues. I want to ask you, Mr. Kono, about your comments about, you talked about the robustness of democracy in this and in Japan and the need to kind of stress that as in the global architecture. And I guess in Japan, um, there's a strong vein of people doing the right thing. Um, arguably, we could talk about the UK, which is also a democracy and whether people did the right thing, but I don't want to get into that here. But there's a question from one of our one of our viewers is, do you believe that the concept of democracy will change after the pandemic? Do the tenets of democracy need to be examined? Um, do you see that changing in any way? That was one question from the floor. Uh, could, you, could you repeat? Could you repeat? I lost your voice. Do you, believe, do you believe that the concept of democracy will change after the pandemic um, in terms of re-endorsing democracy on the global stage, for example? is it, are, are there certain parts of that that need to be strengthened, for example? Well, I think the democratic country have been doing, uh, doing it pretty well. I mean, it takes time to make decisions but through democratic process, we get people understand the concept of what we need to do. And uh, people are much easier to obey the rules uh, rather than, you know, the central government telling people what to do without much explanation. So uh, I think the democracy works through this uh, COVID-19 quite well. It takes time to initiate or it takes time to let the government authorize, I mean, exercise authority. Uh, but once people understand uh, what they need to do or what this is all about, I think in through the, in a democratic country, uh, I think people understand and people behave uh, accordingly. So uh, at the end of the day, I think democracy will manage uh situation uh better than dictatorship in the long run and something both of you talked about um throughout is data sharing and there is interest from our our viewers today about um the sharing of data and i wonder if you could talk and uh, maybe start with minister amisha about the challenges of data sharing with the private sector because obviously you know a lot a, a big big private pharmaceutical companies will say, well, even though we're acting on the global good right now, we also at some point need to think about our own financial futures and we need to think about our business and we need to think about funds for future R&D and we need to think about proprietary information, like how much of what we discover do we share and give away? And I wondered if you could start, uh, Minister Amishab, by talking about the challenge of data sharing when it comes to the private sector. And then I'd be interested also in Minister Kono's questions about that answer. Of course, uh, intellectual property rights are uh, very important uh, to protect uh, what private sector is doing. And that's, that's what encourages them to uh, come to countries versus others. Uh, I want to say that, um, uh, for instance, if I'm going to take the vaccines, uh, uh, given given our location and given the the size of the market and the uh, uh, you know our openness to Africa and proximity, 
uh, many uh, of the big companies are now uh, uh, going to produce the vaccine in Egypt. So this this is an example of, if you want to call it R and D transfer or or collaboration. Uh, uh, that uh, that and here data will be shared with the manufacturers. Data uh, uh, with respect to the tests or or who you know uh, uh, how things are going to be uh, produced and so forth. So um, uh, uh, again, there's 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 more level of openness by virtue of the world we live in today. Um, and uh, uh, I believe, for instance, for some of the vaccines to be approved uh, so that people can travel with them, uh, the, the companies had to avail. Uh, the different uh, uh, tests and the results of the test, so that there's credibility around it. Uh, so um, uh, it's not it's not a perfect world, but we are moving towards more, if you will, compelled openness <laughs> or um, uh, a need to uh, to be uh, more accommodative, uh, whether it's the demands of the private sector for 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 protection or. Uh, if it's uh, for data sharing to be able to move forward uh, and create that ability to move and uh, and be a part of the new global uh, structure that is that is uh, that is coming its way. Um, in uh, in a previous time, you can monopolize gold or you can monopolize oil and you can make wealth out of it. But uh, in today's today's time, uh, you cannot monopolize data. Well, I mean, you could, but uh, if you try to monopolize the data, it probably uh, would not increase its value. You need to share data, and the uh, more you share, uh, the value go up. So. It is very important how you share the data without infringing your privacy. So setting the rule, data sharing rules globally, globally is very important. Right now, uh, some um, private company trying to uh, accumulate data for their own. Them. It looked like, and uh, if if the government trying to dominate data, it probably wouldn't work. So we need to all come forward and talk about how we going to share the data and uh, increase the value, and how we going to share the, those increased value. Uh, so the rule making is uh, very important, and uh, if we are successful. Um, I think it it will increase the val. I mean, the wealth of on this planet. So that's the future we need to go after. Thank you. So we are almost out of time. We only have two minutes left, and I want to thank you both um, for a very interesting conversation and for your candor here today as well. And I I would just like both of you if you have any final thoughts for 60 seconds or so each uh, to give us those um, before we wrap up. Um, I would just say that, um, um, you know, despite the pandemic, I've been able to travel the world over my screen, <laughs> but this has not substituted uh, the human interaction, which is very important to create trust. So um, uh, one of the, the key elements uh, uh, of trust is for people to mingle and be able to, uh, uh, to brainstorm uh, physically. Uh, so uh, I think this is something that we are all looking forward to. Uh, uh, but um, let's not waste all the lessons that we have learned and let's carry them through in the good times because good times are going to come uh, and they are going to also require a lot of collaboration, a lot of uh, uh, trust building uh, to basically uh, push uh, more credibility that is much needed uh, in the future. Since 1980s, I have been involved in promoting a telework and uh, It looks like we may have just lost the minister at the so very many end there. Years, His video was people, starting to... His people are moving out of Tokyo. And, uh, you know, the Tokyo is always sucking up the population. But first time in so many years, people are leaving Tokyo for the rest. 
and uh, it is uh, it is a I think a good thing. And uh, if we can promote telework, uh, I think we can do uh, so many different things in the future. And uh, uh, I think we can enjoy the development of new technology. Ministers, thank you very much for your time today and thank you for the interesting discussion. I hope that our participants have enjoyed it as well. Um, and I wish you safe travels and may we meet in person <laughs> before too long. Thank you for a great moderation. Pleasure meeting everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Lots Take of care. voice.